Thanks everybody for joining this uh, 16 bars Q&A and community screening workshop. First off, I wanna thank the California Film Institute and the Raphael Theater for helping us make this happen. Some 250 of you have RSVP'd for this special event and we're really excited to be using the Raphael at home technology for the first time. So uh, bear with us. Um, we welcome you all to uh, to this event, we've had uh, over a dozen of our social justice reentry partners invite uh, all their members uh, to join. And towards the end of this Q and A, we're going to have a little bit of a community screening workshop uh, to help those people who are here about, by special invitation. So, for those of you who are members of the of CFI, please stick around and learn how to be part of this incredible movement. I'm Steve Michelson, the Executive Director of the Fund for Sustainable Tomorrows. We believe documentaries can change the world and we engage audiences like you all who are here today to make a difference. We work with dedicated filmmakers, in this case with 16 Bars director, Sam Bathrick and Grammy Award winning songwriter and musician Speech Thomas, who's the heart and soul of the film. And both of us are with us today, both of you guys. Their bios uh, and also those of the experts that we're going to have on this Zoom chat uh, are will be available in the chat function, which you can access down below in your control panel. So no reason to have to write anything down or take notes. You're going to get a lot of information during this uh, discussion. So as we discuss these issues uh, on reentry and and how COVID is affecting our uh, prison system. Bear in mind these two facts that have been the central driving facts for our entire campaign. First, that nearly 70% of the people who are released back into society will be back in prison in three years because they haven't received the skills or the training to succeed. Uh, and for those of you who thought that, you know, why does that have anything to do with me? In many states, the second point, the costs to incarcerate an individual for a year are more than it costs to send one student to Harvard. And guess who's paying for that? That's right, all of us here today. Lastly, as I mentioned, so much a part of the reason why we wanna do this today is because the COVID pandemic has raised the urgency of all of these issues. With so many cities forced to early release over half their incarcerated populations, social justice reform has just become a public health issue that underscores the complexity of decarceration and re-entry solutions that are so sorely needed. Let me also introduce our experts on uh, re-entry as well. Uh, just to uh, give you a quick note, Dr. Sarah Scarborough uh, has been uh, head of the uh, 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 real, uh, what's it called again, Sarah? Real, uh, real life. Real life, that's right. And uh, she'll be joining us and also uh, Lynn Twyman as well. So let's get started uh, as well. Um, I do want to introduce uh, Thorn Day, who will be joining us later on as well as one of our participants. Um, so uh, I think uh, I'm going to start with some questions here with Sam and, and, and Speech. Sam, you, uh, how did this whole thing start? It's, it, was, it was amazing. How did you? get going on this film. Sure, well, thanks for having me here and uh, thank you for our, our, all the people that are attending. Um, it means a lot to us that you've taken the time to, to see this film. Um, Speech and I are here reunited on this screen with all of you, so this, this is special. Um, I mean, the film is a, a long time in the making. Um, you know, Speech uh, and his manager, Joe, had made, um, contact with this jail um, uh, and over the course of years had discussed um, going in and, and maybe doing some kind of a workshop. And during that time, uh, you know, um, Speech and I had met um, at, on, an, on a previous project and, and just discussed the possibility of filming it. But I don't think on Speech's side or on my side as a um, partner at a production company in Brooklyn that we really knew necessarily what that would mean or even that we were going to make a film or that it would be this film. Um, this film came about from from our experience, both mine and speeches, um, meeting the guys that were at the Richmond City Justice Center in 2017 when we went there to film. 
um, Garland, Teddy, Devante, Anthony, and when their stories started to come to light and when their lyrics um, started to come be a part of the film and a part of the album, um, you know, it was a learning process for us. I think both Speech and I would say we're not experts in the way that a lot of people on this, pan uh, on this panel are on these issues. Um, we were there to listen in Speech's case he was also there to counsel and to record the music, but you know we were witnesses. And um, the kind of films that I like to make um, make the audience a witness to something, um, get out of the way of the explanation of what of what that means, and just let you experience it. So um, you know, it it it's a it's a long it's a longer story to say what how did you make the film, but that's the the short version. Cool and speech. You know, as a successful musician, how did you get involved and what was your original goal and how, how much well do you think it's manifested? Well, first of all, I've had um, a very big concern about the amount of people that are being incarcerated in our country and the amount of people in the black community in particular that I know personally and that I don't know being incarcerated sometimes for just reasons and, so, and many times for unjust reasons. And this has been an issue that's been concerning me for decades. And so when I had an opportunity to go into this particular jail, it was a no brainer for my manager, Joe, to, to say, hey, why don't we see what we could do there? Because he knew my heart on the issue. And also I think it's been um, life-changing for me. I, there's so many things that I learned from the individuals that I met uh, Garland, Devante, Teddy, Anthony, um, being in the jail and meeting other people that weren't in the film made a huge impact on my heart, on my perception of those that are incarcerated and on some of the issues revolving around why they're there in the first place. So it's been a great journey for me and a learning experience for me. So I'm really, I'm really proud of this film and I'm very grateful to have worked on this with Sam and the Resident family and Lightyear and everyone that's been involved. Sam, you shot over 200 hours of footage for this film, and and uh, to make a 90-minute film, you didn't, you and Speech didn't even know which characters you guys were going to follow originally. How did, uh, you know, what was your North Star and how to figure this whole puzzle out? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. I mean, uh, well, first of all, you know, there's uh, a team of people that made this film, and I'm one of them, so in a lot of ways, the answer to that is, you know, North Star was the editor of the film, Al Sherman. Um, but I think, you know, to answer the question more broadly, um, we kept, you know, when you're given footage like this or when you capture footage like this, there's a lot of different ways you could package it. And Speech and I had conversations about this throughout. Um, a film is, is first and foremost made to be entertaining. You have to be able to sit through it. But um, how you turn those dials, how entertaining do you want it to be versus how true do you want it to be? Um, and the truth, and I, I've said this so many times, but the truth is usually um, a lot messier than we would like it to be to wrap it up in 90 minutes. So I think the North Star was first and foremost, what's the truth what, uh, of what we're trying to say here? Um, and the truth about any human being is gonna be complex and can't be boiled down. Um, to a nice little sound bite. So, you know, I think we we really tried to get out of the way of, um, of what we wanted to say about these guys' stories and let them um, tell their own stories. Um, but, you know, how you get 200 hours down to 90 minutes, um, I think, you know, we were lucky in that this film was built around the, the, the process of recording an album. And so those recording sessions and those lyrics became the window um, into the inner workings of the people that we were there to film. Um, and we really looked at the, the music and the sessions that that speech was a part of um, as a way of really diving into um, what the central issue that each one of the, the men in our film was trying to deal with. There's things that you say in a journal entry or in a, in a lyric book that you can't say in an interview, even if you wanted to. And so that was the gift of the film. And we really tried to build it, um, to build our narrative around that. Cool. 
yeah, a speech maybe talking to both young musicians and people at risk of incarceration. What has been your biggest takeaway from the film and your message to those who can contribute to this movement? Uh, you know, how do you see this music and hip hop in particular playing a role in prison reform and social justice? Well, that's a fantastic question. Um, since the very beginnings of my career, I have felt like music and in particular hip hop has really been a godsend to my people because we number one, look at hip hop as more than just entertainment. For many people in our community, it is almost like scripture. It is like Proverbs. Hip hop is shaping, informing, and communicating to our community. And it has been for 30 years now, over 30 years. And so it also is the most powerful and the most popular music genre on the planet Earth. So bringing it to a microcosm of bringing it into this jail it, I knew that it had the power to transform and to, to express feelings that are really just hard to express. As you just said a minute ago, it's hard to express in normal situations. And it's in the complexities are able to reach people's minds and hearts because it's music. Music has a way above politics, above even spirituality. It has a way of reaching people across the planet and bringing light to something that can be quite uh, muddy and dark. And so I knew that it could, it, it could really be powerful. And I'm really proud of how the, the, the sessions turned out. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to remind everyone uh, to uh, take a look at the uh, four fabulous music videos that uh, Sam and Speech have done that are available as links here in the chat room. And, also in the invitation that you received and also on our website at the Fund for Sustainable Tomorrows uh, on the 16 bars page. So you'll be able to do all of that uh, as part of uh, enjoying this, uh, this event. Let's introduce a little more formally our two experts. Of course, most of you know Dr. Sarah Scarborough from the film. She practiced tough love with everybody that she participated with at Real Life and Lynn Twyman, who has been with our campaign from the outset. Lynn grew up in a family where her father was incarcerated and has dedicated her life's work to helping people navigate what she calls life as a returning citizen. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's start with you, Lynn. Um, you have really helped define our vocabulary uh, that uh, really dehumanizes the, the de de dehumanizing language that's in correctional facilities that we're stuck with. We, we really have uh, learned a lot from that. We invite our audience to download this new vocabulary uh, that we have created where you'll find uh, new words for everyone. Uh, prisoners aren't ex-cons anymore, they're returning citizens. And the entire process of re-entry is uh, something that society has to play a role in. Uh, so, uh, if you do nothing else from this, all of you, if you adopt our new vocabulary, you'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of things change in your world. And also, please remember for everybody who missed a part of this or wants to uh, recommend it, that it will be playing as part of the Rafael at Home screening of the film 16 Bars. You will be able to continue, uh, and watch the Q&A afterwards. So, uh, Lynn, just tell us a little bit about your journey, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Steve, and thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, it is a family reunion tonight, and um, to all of our attendees as well. So just a little bit of, of my journey. Um, as you mentioned, Steve, my father was incarcerated. He served time in the federal prison, and uh, he was there as a result of charges related to his mental illness. So that is a part of the driving force that I have in in terms of this work and then also too, having the opportunity to work with law enforcement and in law enforcement um, to implement uh, re-entry programming, actually the first ever for the Baltimore City, City Police Department. And uh, my partner uh, in crime, if you will, is actually joining us tonight, uh, Officer Horn. So thank you so much, shout out to him. 
Um, but we helped over 400 returning citizens along with their families, individuals that have been home for some time um, get connected with services. So the work still continues today um, for me as a consultant and working in the space in terms of helping to change policy and helping to uh, stream funding in the right directions to community-based organizations, very similar to what Sarah does with, uh, with real life. And um, this whole issue with COVID in particular has also changed the dynamic of incarceration and jail detention as well. Um, so when we talk about COVID, for example, um, not only have we seen that prisons and jails are not equipped for crises just like this. But also we have seen as many people as what we have been doing pre-COVID. And so for example, statistics show like San Francisco, they've reduced their jail population by approximately 50%, 50% since February of this year as a result of COVID. And so what we can do when you talked about those savings is we can move those savings in terms of incarceration and move it towards programs like Real Life, for example. Move it towards more community-based uh, at-home detention and allow people the opportunity to get the critical programs and services that they need. Because a lot of times we talk about rehabilitation. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the vocabulary, for example. A lot of times there is no rehabilitation, especially when we talk about the massive amount of people that are incarcerated for low level offenses or for violent related offenses, what we're talking about is habilitation. Because if there is not a healthy norm or base from which a person is coming from, how are they being rehabilitated? And so when we talk about corrections in the United States of America, historically, it has not been corrections. What it's been, what it has been is locking people up, throwing away the key, and everybody, by and large, has the right to be released back to the community after they serve their time. But what are they coming back to? How is their, their attitude and, and the way they look at life? How do they deal with stress and trauma? And so what we're talking about here, COVID has showed us that we can have a different approach to incarceration, to jail detention, and now is the time to take advantage of that and implement the right type of policies that are going to stick. Let's just not make this a one-off just because of this, this virus, but let's institute and implement the change that is needed. And um, you know, lastly, I, I wanna say that, that everybody has the right to a second chance. And so even though the film addresses adult incarceration, but as the viewers saw, a lot of the problems started in childhood and so COVID has affected the juvenile, uh, uh, the juvenile population as well. It has actually allowed families the opportunity to, in, in, in many cases, focus more on their young people than maybe what they haven't done in times past. Um, and so this is what COVID has showed us. Um, and again, this is a part, of, a part of my journey, as you mentioned. I mean, I could go on, but I wanna give up other people the opportunity to talk this evening. Well. Sarah, let's, uh, let's hear from you a little bit because you had an amazing feat to convince a warden to, to have the program that you had and, and uh, also to have them, all of these characters come through uh, real life. You know, uh, how would you describe the outcomes in this film in general? Is this sort of an unusual group of people and, and what has happened since, since the COVID uh, virus outbreak? Oh, you have to unmute yourself, Sarah. There we go. All right. <laughs> thank you. Um, but thank you so much for that question and for this um, awesome opportunity tonight to share more with folks from all over our country. Um, you know, I will say that I was so incredibly blessed to work under Sheriff Woody. Um, you know, today you see 
programming in so many jails and so many prisons. But you have to think when we started programming in the Richmond jail, that was back in like around 2008. Um, and so that was way before programming began. That was still when it was very much so the lock them up and throw them away the key mentality. Um, and so Sheriff Woody just has a passion to um, provide rehabilitation and habilitation opportunities for folks. And um, he's a very out of the box type of person. And so really any opportunities that we brought to him that he saw could be beneficial to those in his custody, he was all about it. Um, and as you see from the film and then many other things we did, there was many things that I think probably 95% of sheriffs and wardens and superintendents of jails and prisons would say absolutely not. Um, but he was all about because of the long term outcome, which is um, producing better citizens as opposed to better criminals upon release. Um, so Sheriff Woody is still extremely active. I think he's enjoying retirement now that he's not Sheriff of um, Richmond anymore, um, but he is still extremely active and on our board of real life. So we are incredibly blessed um, to continue to have him as a part of it. Excellent. And, and in terms of COVID in your community and in the Richmond community in general, how, has, how have things changed uh, in your community? Um, so real life altogether, we are operating pretty much like this um, via technology and from a distance, um, you know, with the folks that we serve face time and building relationships is extremely important. And so we really didn't know how this was going to go. Uh, you know, many people that we serve don't know a lick about technology or Zoom or computers or anything. Um, we were able to get a little grant from a community foundation here to purchase tablets for our recovery houses, um, which has been huge. And so we are still offering all of our services just from a distance. Um, that said, kind of on a broader scale, you know, Virginia is doing what many other places are doing, as we have kind of talked about. Um, there are releasing a lot of folks from jails and prisons that are both nonviolent offenders within a year of release, but then people are getting released on parole. Um, and Virginia abolished parole back in 95, and so it's something that conservative Virginia just doesn't do very much. Um, so the fact that we're releasing folks on parole um, is a big deal, um, but it's been also extremely controversial because of who they're releasing. Um, most recently, the parole board approved to have somebody who killed a police officer years ago um, and some very serious violent crimes. So it's um, one of the controversies going on in Virginia. Um, but, um, you know, fortunately, the COVID numbers in our community at Virginia aren't too terribly high, knock on wood within jails and prisons and nursing homes are extremely high. Um, and so, you know, that that's a huge problem where you can't quarantine somebody for 14 days and keep them in distance. And, um, you know, there's got to be deputies and nurses coming in on a daily basis. And so you can't keep them out of um, harm's way. And so it's tough, whether you're incarcerated here in Virginia or elsewhere, um, it's an extremely tough time. On the flip side, what we've seen with people getting released, they want to go out, they want to see people, they want to party, they want to, you know, reconnect and such, and that's going to lead to problems. So it is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, the third piece of that is really the people that are getting out don't have places to go. Uh, you know, you can't incarcerate somebody for 30 years and then give them three days to develop a home plan. Um, and so the reentry has really struggled. Probation offices are screaming right now because they don't have the capacity to manage everybody coming home. Um, so it's tough. It's a really, really tough situation all across the board. Uh, Sarah, speaking about the characters quick. in our film, I know you've ha had a chance to be in touch with Garland Carr. Maybe you can give us a little background about uh, what has happened with him. Sure. Um, Garland is at an institution called Dil Dillwyn right now. 
he was shipped shortly after um, the, well, probably about a year after the film was completed, he was shipped to prison. And so that's where he will be um, until he's released in a few years from now. As I understand it, he is in the kitchen cooking. So he's staying busy doing something, um, which is a good thing. Um, he's made progress in his relationship with Kelly, which I think maybe we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, but I think he's just doing the best he can, considering he had the utmost motivation while in the program and is then just shipped off to prison. Um, you know, that's never easy, but I think he's staying strong. And, and do you have any other just, information? Can about I just add one thing to... Go ahead. Sorry. I just, just because... I'm not sure everybody on here knows, but since since the completion of the film, um, Sarah has left um, being the program director for the Richmond City Justice Center and has opened um, re-entry uh, houses um, through real life, um, more than one at this point, I believe, Sarah, a men's house and a women's house in mm -hmm. Richmond, Virginia. So that's sort of this, uh, another chapter in Sarah's story that you saw her in the film working inside the jail and a lot of what's happened next has been for taking those efforts outside um, and really addressing reentry, so it's a it's a piece that obviously we didn't cover in our film, but I think is there's so many people on this chat who are involved with organizations like that. I'm reading about it now, so I just wanted to connect the dots since it's it appreciate that, the Sam. Yeah, very much. Yeah, and and Sarah, do you have any other information about about Teddy or any of the other characters in the film that you can share with our audience? Yeah, um, I've been in some sort of communication with all of them. Um, we call real life family. So once we kind of do life with somebody for a little while, we tend to stay connected in some way, shape or form. Um, so Teddy has kind of bounced around as you saw him at the end of the film. He was in Miami, Florida. Um, he then went to the initial screening of 16 bars actually in California where this um, Zoom is being posted from and was there. Um, sadly ended up homeless on the streets in California after that um, programming didn't quite work out for him there. Um, we then were able to get him across country to Kentucky to complete some programming. Um, and he's just had his ups and downs, you know, to be 100% candid, I just, his he's not ready for that change you know it sounds great in theory not being homeless sounds great but deep down in your heart if you're not ready for that change there's nothing on earth that can force you to do that um and so unfortunately until he has his true heart change um we're gonna see the same result which is what we saw at the end of the film um Devante is currently incarcerated in um, Henrico Jail, which is right next to Richmond where we're located. I stay in pretty consistent contact with him actually. And um, he's doing well, you know, his issue was he went out on his own way too soon. Um, and unfortunately that meant for him going back to his mom. And for everybody who saw the film, saw when he got out what he was going back to with his mom. Um, and that's tough. And, you know, that's a whole different discussion um, than we have right now. But ultimately, the family that's actively using, the outcome is probably going to be that. And so um, he ultimately got 20 years, 15 suspended. So he has an active sentence of five years. Um, he's got about two and a half left, um, but he has been court ordered to our program upon release. So we will definitely see him in that form and hopefully he can get it right. Um, and then Anthony, um, he's Anthony. <laughs> what can I tell you? You love him and he's like the little brother you just want to knock upside the head at the same time. But um, I've not talked to him for a couple of months, so I'm not exactly sure of his whereabouts, but he's just still kind of kicking and screaming as he goes along from what my last conversation was and that I understand. Um, yeah. It's no wonder that your, your uh, business and your, your foundation is called Real Life because you obviously are dealing with a lot of that. It um, is, it is, yeah. And, and you uh, know, we, one, one other thing that I will quickly add is 
Sam and speech and myself and others talk so many times, we would have loved more than anything to have a true success story at the end of the film. Um, but the film is 100% authentic. And unfortunately, this is tough. Um, there are more people who do not make it than do. And that's our nationwide statistics. Um, and so that is just the real life, life rawness of this. Um, that said, there are people who come out on the other side and are extremely successful. Um, I think we've got a couple of them, Chris, Jason, Khalif, and a few others currently in our program on the call right now who are on that other side doing incredible things, um, you know, really making progress, working, paying taxes. Um, so it does work. Um, but unfortunately, you know, there are folks that aren't just aren't ready for it. Thank you for that, Sarah. That's uh, quite a good check in. Uh, and before we accept, start accepting questions from you, our audience, I want to let you know a couple of extraordinary things about the film. Uh, the music from 16 Bars, which, by the way, you can all download from any major platform, uh, with the advance of the, of, uh, from our distribution team, Garland used the uh, money from, uh, from that music to actually purchase uh, a wedding ring and get married to uh, someone who's going to be joining our conversation right now. Uh, Kelly Carr is her new name. She's Garland's wife, who you met in the film. Uh, Kelly, are you uh, are you there to say hello to us? Oh, hold on, hold on. sorry. Ah. Hey, can you hear me? Sorry. We can hear you, absolutely. I don't know How are you doing? Why does it keep doing that? Are you there? Can you hear me, Kelly? Okay. Well, 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 maybe, Steve, I think Speech had something um, that he was trying to say. All right. Yeah. Speech, what was that? Uh, I forgot. Well, let me, I, I did want to say that what you were alluding to about the real life reality, Sam and I, we discussed a lot during this filming as to whether or not we're going to allow this to just be a capsule of time. And that's what I think any viewer has to really understand about this film is it's a capsule of time. It, it's, it's from a, be a beginning date to an end date. And it's not by any means the end of their story. Mm -hmm. And also we had a choice creatively and we talked a lot about this and I really give it to Sam because he was, he was very staunch about making sure we didn't create some type of false narrative allow it to be what it is and allow people to pull from it the complexities, the realities, the beauty, and everything else. And that's what I think that this film does. And I think that that's sort of unique from a lot of films that cover this. So I, I thought that that was a good thing. Yeah, well said and uh, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, and, and for you audience members, you've had a chance now to meet Sam and Speech and Sarah and Lynn and and Kelly will, I'm sure, come back in here and possibly even a special guest that we're hoping to bring to you. But go ahead and fire your questions uh, to any of our team here uh, through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And uh, I will uh, be happy to, to, uh, to ask our team. Our campaign's been going now for about two years and we've had some fantastic uh, screenings all over the country. We opened in New York originally at the Village East, which was a fantastic screening with a number of great partners there. Um, while we're waiting for a few questions to arise, I just wanna let give a shout out to all the great organizations that are part of this conversation. The Archdiocese of San Francisco, their restorative justice ministry has been a partner of ours. They're the ones who informed us how the selves and uh, the ranks of incarcerated people in San Francisco has uh, gone to half in the last month or so. Catholic Charity, Charities of Washington, D.C., the Cinnamon Cinephile, the Justice Roundtable, Lasers, which is a group that, uh, that Lynn has created, is an amazing group, the Meta Center for Nonviolence, uh, who I'm working with on a film now as well called uh, The Third Harmony. 
Uh, the National Ascent Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, the NACDL, is part of this conversation. Okay, and let me interrupt this now for some breaking news here. We've got Kelly and special guest, Garland Carr. That's right. Here he is on my phone. Garland, everyone can hear you now. Hey, hey what's up, everybody? Hey, Garland. It's good to hear your voice. It's great to hear your voice, Garland. You know, uh, people have compared you to Adam Levine and the next Maroon 5. How is your music going? He asked how your music is going, Garland. I mean, you know, unfortunately, man, the place I'm at doesn't really have a music program, you know. Uh, there was talk of trying to get one going, but uh, obviously this whole coronavirus thing is like stopped everything, you know. Um, and I mean, the, the place that I'm at is actually in the midst of like a really bad epidemic, like uh, almost like half the people here. Like, uh, so I just write, you know, I just always write. Um, and uh, really that's all I can do right now, you know. But I've always got lyrics knocking around. around, around. Great. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, you're here now with us too. So say hello and uh, and tell us how uh, how this whole thing really has uh, come about for you post-film. Um, well, I think y'all heard I got married um, or we got married, but um, it's been hard. I mean, with the COVID stuff, obviously I don't get to see him and visit him, but we at least have phone calls for now <laughs> until they, they shut those down. So Garland, what are you? Uh, what does your day look like now? Are you? Uh, is there anything that you do uh, where you feel like your health is uh, in social distancing or compromised? Sorry about that. Yeah, Sarah, did you hear that question? No, go ahead and say it again. Sorry. Oh. This is not easy. Yeah. Oh, so you, are you, Kelly, do you have Garland on your phone? Yeah, he's on there now. Yeah, just to, if you could explain his day, his daily routine, that would, I think, uh, be very informative. Did you hear that? My daily routine here? Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, things are, like, different now. You know, now that this whole, this whole pandemic thing is kind of just like dead time, um, you know, normally in a prison, I mean, I had a job, you know, I was the staff cook, so I like, you know, got up at 4.30 every morning and went to work most days of the week, you know, and worked over there serving staff and, uh, you know, kind of hung out over there. It was like, you know, kind of like my usual gig of like working at a restaurant, you know, on the street, but um, a, a really low grade restaurant, but uh, uh, nowadays, man, I mean, we're all just stuck in the block, like we're like, you know, everybody's isolated, uh, you know, like, so you're just stuck in a dorm with the people in your dorm. So, I mean, I wake up now, you know, uh, count times like six in the morning and I, you just sit in the pod all day. You know, I do a lot of reading, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like a history nerd, uh, and, you know, I'm blessed, you know, my family and Kelly looks out on me for books and stuff. So, I've always got cool stuff to read, uh, but my days now, you know, consist of like laying around, reading. Uh, I don't really watch a lot of TV, but that's most people's escape. Uh, and then, you know, we get one hour of outside rec right now, and I go outside and work out like crazy for an hour. <laughs> Come in and take a shower and, uh, and, you know, go to bed and do it again the next day. Right now, Life is pretty boring, you know, and um, and options are limited. Um, but yeah, you know. That's good. Well, hang in there. You've got a great wife who's waiting for you when you re-enter. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I love her, man. I lucked out. I know. I, I heard that you know people were asking about the whole proposal thing uh, here in prison, man. But you know the. Um, you know, the uh, the soundtrack deal was a big blessing, man, because I was able to, you know, put a ring on her finger, you know, with my scratch, and uh, I would have hated to, like, ask her to marry me without being able to do that. 
Uh, so, you know, I did get down on one knee in the prison visiting room, <laughs> and she was very embarrassed and, and tried to pull me up off of oh my God. knee, but uh, really, I went through with it, you know. <clears throat> well, we are proud of you, and it's just the human spirit indoors under every one of these situations, and it's really, uh, it's absolutely amazing that, uh, that you're here talking to us now, and that uh, you and Kelly are together. We uh, we honor and respect you, and and wish you the best going forward, uh, especially when you will still be running this campaign. I have a feeling by the time you do get out, so. So we'll be checking yeah. back in with you for sure and want to follow up on that music. I have a couple of questions now. Yeah, man. I got a lot more music, you know. <laughs> I got a lot more. And, uh, you know, that's one thing I would just want people to know is, like, you know, that's, that's I mean, that's how I deal with, you know, my reality, man. And uh, I look forward to getting out, you know, and, um, you know, and, and finally doing what I was created to do, man. So I, we all look forward to it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we have some questions I want to just answer. Uh, one, we've got one from Doug Meager who wants to know how we can see the film if Amazon Prime is the only way. But uh, for this current week, it is still playing on the Rafael Theater at home. So uh, for any of you who uh, want to recommend that people see it, our host tonight is screening the film for a week, uh, a theatrical virtual week. And then uh, we're told that it might actually be held over for additional time. So don't miss a chance to see it at the Rafael at home. We have Angelin from uh, from Philadelphia, right? And she's asking if Lynn can discuss a little bit about the trauma and mental health issues in the returning community. Lynn, why don't you just wax eloquently on that for a minute or two? Sure, absolutely. So Angelin, thank you so much for your um, your question. And mental health trauma are huge within um, within the uh, incarcerated population. In fact, a majority have trauma histories, everything stemming from domestic violence, um, street violence, sexual assault, things that so many have experienced. And, you know, the work that I did, especially in Baltimore, providing services, going behind the walls, you know, when I would go in and talk with the female population about domestic violence, for example, a majority would raise their hand and say that they have experienced domestic violence. Mental health is it, mental health issues are also very very big because trauma affects the mental health of an individual. And so, when we talk about incarceration, detention, we have to have a more therapeutic approach to how we serve the population. And as I mentioned earlier, um, directing funding resources to more community-based organizations and more holistic structures within uh, detention and prison facilities is key in order to helping individuals um, become sustainable and thrive, not only within incarceration, but also after they return, because they're going to return home to the community. They're going, going to return home to families and to children if they have children. And you know that's something that happened with my father. He came home to me, um, and that's another story for another day. Um, but I've lived it as a survivor of a, of a returned citizen. And then in terms of resources, there are resources, community-based resources throughout the United States that help individuals with trauma, with mental illness, who have been incarcerated. Um, but the, the resources are only as good as the leadership. So Sarah, for example, has a phenomenal program. She's a great leader in this space. And she's proven, she's tried, she's tested. And so... What I encourage people to do is to find out what resources are available in their local community, get connected with, um, you know, there are criminal justice coordinating councils, for example, when we talk about policy and bringing together all the stakeholders. Um, and that, that can be a place to start, as well as just going online and finding out what is available, typing in keyword searches like reentry, returning citizen in your location, and see what pops up. Um, and then, of course, if you need additional resources after you know tonight's screening that you just can't seem to find locally, one of us can be available to, to um, help assist you with that. Um, but yes, mental health and trauma are, are huge issues that have to be addressed and have to be faced with every returned citizen with 
person that is incarcerated, whether they're in jail or in prison. Great. I just want to make that correction that Angela is with the, uh, she's in Delaware, not Philadelphia, uh, with the National Network for Justice, who made that question. And, and Speech, she has a question for you as well, uh, of whether or not you anticipate doing any more work with incarcerated people or formerly incarcerated people. Yeah, I think it's inevitable. And we have, um, Sam and I have talked a lot about this. We've met people throughout the nation and even outside of the nation um, about the issue. And there's, when you put something out like this, there's a lot of people that share a same or a similar passion. And there's a lot of people that are doing incredible work out there as well. And just may not have had the same platform that 16 Bars the Film has had. And we've connected with a lot of those people. So this, this almost becomes viral in its own right amongst people that see it. And they wanna get, they wanna see more and they also have more resources. So ever since we've been um, screening this in all types of places, we've gotten a lot more talented people that, that now we have connections to. And um, so yeah, it's, it's been inevitable that we'll do something more. And speech, here's another question for you from Sammy Dane in our, audi in our, our audience. He says, I know uh, you were able to impart a lot of wisdom on the guys in the film, but which artists did you learn from the most while you were working with them? Well, it's, it's a great question. I really learned from all of them. Um, I learned from Garland. I mean, he's, he's an incredibly um, strong man. With, with a very strong will. And I learned a lot from him. And, and even as a songwriter, I learned the power of being able to use music and arts as a cathartic source to get out your, your, your stress, your anger. So these are things that were reiterated for me because I, I do the same thing with music. Um, Teddy and I spent a lot of time together outside of the filming of this and learned a ton of, of, of things from him. Um, his tenacity, his wisdom, a very intelligent, spiritual man, and um, caught up at the end of the day with addiction and some emotional things that he's dealing with. So I learned that people have certain strengths despite whatever weaknesses they might be facing at this point in their journey. And then also, I had a chance to connect with uh, Devante recently um, when I was just in Richmond for a concert and, and, and connect with him and his strength of just being resolved to change things when he gets back out again. And Anthony, uh, I actually have been deeply uh, moved by some of the things that he shared, even in the film. Um, what he felt was his first snapping point, seeing his mother being abused and when the police came to the door and she said nothing was wrong, basically, things like that stick with me as to what is various people's um, beginnings down paths that they would make, they, they later regret. So all of them have, have made an impact on me. To say the most, it would be hard. I would say that I've spent the most time with Teddy. So maybe that's the person I would say, you know, I've had the chance to get the most inspiration from because he's been out and and he's come to Atlanta, so he spent time with me here in Atlanta. I've seen him in San Rafael. I've seen him in various places. So, you know, yeah. Codling, who uh, uh, has asked whether or not Garland, if you're still on the phone, if you'd like to sing a new verse of something you're working on. You can ask him, Garland, do you want to sing anything while we're on? <laughs> well, uh, when you ask that question, whoever asked, I appreciate it, but I would like them to keep in mind that I am in a prison dormitory with people about 18 <laughs> inches away from me on either side on the phone, and uh, there's 80 incarcerated men in here, <laughs> and um, and I have to continue to live in here after this call, so. Uh, All right, well, we'll, we will appreciate it. I'd probably rather not. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Antonio, that means you're going to have to get the 
get the album, download the album, because there yeah, are songs. You know, there's, the, there's the plug right there, buy the album. There's songs <laughs> on the album that are not in the film for all of you. So. Yeah. Here's right. a question, uh, Sam, for you from Tom Eddington. Will you consider another film following up on the stories and lives of the people involved in, the, in 16 Bars? Um, <laughs> well, you know, like we, we started this film in 2017 and, you know, um, in many ways, I don't think that we're finished with this one um, in the sense that we're still connecting with so many people um, through events like this, through screening. Um, in a lot of ways, the film hasn't even begun to um, reach outside of um, our, you know, of the U.S. So um, first and foremost, I think the focus is um, is to continue to get this film out there because, you know, the point of this was to start a discussion um, and it's this discussion that we're in right now. Um, as Speech said, there's, there's, it's sort of hard to know when you could, you could, we could have kept filming, you know, um, and there would have been entire other films about what's happened since we stopped. Um, so in a way I'm relieved that we stopped and that, um, you know, life, life is gonna go on for everybody. Um, and in a lot of ways, the, the most helpful I can be to the guys in the film at this moment is probably not by pointing a camera at them, but by showing up for them in other ways. Um, so that's one question is, is it actually helpful or useful at this point to show back up with a camera to Devante's mom's house or, um, or is it more helpful for me to be a supporter of real life so when Devante gets out, um, he has a place to go. So, um, I do hope that we keep making movies that make people think um, and and talk, and that you know bring people to the table like this. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Lynn, why don't you answer this question from Khalif Hope? He says, "What can be done about the loophole between the criminal justice system and the mental health system?" Mm, so that is a really good question. So I'm going to start with where we are. Presently, in terms of uh, prison and jail facilities, they're not going away anytime soon. So what we have to do is we have to encourage and again, get behind policy change, which is driven through advocacy and encourage, strongly encourage and have policies change so that the approach within these facilities are a more therapeutic approach that that the community is calling for an assessment of what programs and how they're being administered when people are, are in jail or in prison. And, and until the community becomes educated and fully aware and can be that driving force to pressure um, the prospective Department of Corrections or the jails or their uh, prospective state um, public safety secretaries. So this is where it starts. It starts with the education and the knowledge, but then also the action. Because a lot of times this stuff happens when society sits back and either they have uh, a lack of knowledge or they are ignorant, meaning they ignore what's going on and they think because it doesn't affect me, I'm not going to do anything about it. But then when it does affect them, it's almost too late, right? because now you're in the midst of it. But for those of us that have the knowledge, the awareness, the understanding through this film, we're, we're conversating, let's take it a step further and call for a level of accountability and an assessment. So how do you do that, right? You go to your state legislatures, you, you coordinate with your local criminal justice coordinating councils, your local community-based organizations, like I said, a real life program and you start those conversations and you have an invested, invested interest. In other words, you're just not a one-off. You you're in this for the long haul. That's how we start to look at and implement these types of services within um, our, our um, prison and also within our jails. But then we have to take a step further and again, take advantage of this COVID um, emergency that we're in and call that the and have a call that these facilities change their approach and also change the way that they're being managed and operated and I see a question 
question coming about about uh, the private companies and the whole prison industrial complex uh, piece. So I don't know if you want to save that for somebody else, but well, we'll happily hear your your comment on that, Sarah. Why don't you uh, okay. chime in also about these private uh, our private prison system? Just by looking at Lynn's face, I can tell we're probably on the same page with <laughs> with most things we have been at least, but. Um, you know, I'm sure that there's some great ones out there. Um, I've not seen too many of them, though. Um, you know, we work with one private prison. Um, it's a regional jail in Williamsburg, the Virginia Peninsula Regional Jail. I will say they are phenomenal, and they are trying to get people out and to stay out. Um, but that said, I think that's the rare. Um, you know, they literally get contracts and get paid per bed that is full. So if people get out and stay out, they're not getting paid, which means they can't meet their budget. Um, and so they have, as the comment said, they have an incentive to keep a high population. Um, and so it's, it's terrible. And I've seen locally, um, there was a private um, jail that had such incredible success with lowering of recidivism rates because of the program that was being brought in there that they kicked the program out um, because they didn't want that. And so that's just, I mean, it's just inhumane. And I think that's the nicest, um, most ladylike way that I can say that. Um, but it's big bucks. You know, Sheriff Woody always talks about it. Prison industrialization is big, big bucks. You know, you look at canteen and the food they get in there, a can of Pringles that we can buy at Walmart for 99 cents is five bucks. You know, so any way you look at it, it is an industry. And as long as it's an industry, people are going to be warehoused um, and they are dollar signs as they go in. Sam and speech, we have a question here from S.C. Mathis. If any of your perceptions were challenged or changed as a result of the film? Well, I can say quickly that my, you know, I'm a producer, I'm a musician, I'm an artist, I'm an MC. I'm going in to make music. And at the end of the day, we didn't know what we were going to face. And one of the perceptions that were deeply changed for me was the level of talent. Um, hearing Garland's songs and, and his writing ability um, hearing Teddy's lyrics and his abilities, so on and so forth. I just was really moved by the amount of talent. And we only focused on four men. There was others that we interacted with that didn't make the film. And, 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 a, and one in particular did make the film, and I'm forgetting his name, but he's playing piano. Again, just fantastic work. And um, I was... I was deeply relieved because this was this was bound to happen that I'm going in and I'm and I'm supposed to come out with something. And I didn't know what I was expecting. And I also didn't know if there was going to be anyone that had any kind of talent that's worth listening to at the end of the day. And I was relieved to find that it was awesome. Can you talk a little bit, speech, about the this generational curse is what uh, Angela and Fraser Giles is calling it, uh, of whether or not there's a, you know, a, a uniqueness to the different generations, uh, or whether it's the environment or a little bit of both in terms of how, how everybody winds up, uh, you know, in, in, in being incarcerated in the first place. Yeah, I'm very big on that. So I'm glad that they asked that question. I believe that the old adage that an ounce of prevention beats a pound of cure. And so many of us who are on this panel tonight are dealing with trying to help the cure area and trying to help the prevention area. I, as an MC, and a lot of what I do in the work I do in my music is the prevention area. I go, uh, Lynn was talking about how she'll go into various places and hear people's testimonies and the trauma that people are going through. I go to middle schools and grade schools, and there is a culture in this country that we have got to change and start telling the truth about. There is 
historical oppression and realities that are deeply impacting the future and the present of this country. And so it is creating, in many instances, more than not, it is creating an environment for failure. It is creating an environment for destruction and corrosion. And in particular, in my community, I see it all around me. And so it's been something that I speak about from the beginnings of my music career from the late 80s to now. And it's, it's so important to me. So yes, this generational curse, there is a America that we perceive from the propaganda that's being told about America, and then there's the truth. And we've got to start dealing with the truth because it not only sets us free as the biblical verse implies, but it also helps us to be more, as Lynn was alluding to, aware, conscious, not ignorant of the issues that are right in front of us. It's one thing for us to try to help people as they re-enter society, and it's another thing to try to prevent their children from ever going this route. And that's one of the things that I really strive to focus on and talk about through what I do, which is music. And um, I do think that that's a very big piece that as we strive to change legislation and laws, that we also educate people to the truth of what has happened in America and how that has directly traumatized generations of people in this country and the effect that it has on us in a real world, real life um, way. Thanks for that speech, really. Your leadership on this film and your the soul that you put into it, it just shines through both in the film and, and after and with all of your involvement and comments, we really appreciate it. Sarah, you. you've been the resident PhD on this project from the beginning. And uh, we have a question here from Queen Karen Garrison uh, talking about people who re-enter, suggesting that nothing that they that they do, they, they aren't even aware of that they are returning, you know, with an illness, essentially. Uh, there aren't any cookie cutter programs for them. And the question is, you know, is there individual counsel that can be given to these people now that they have come back into society? What would you recommend uh, a person do or a family member of that person? Yeah, well, um you know, kind of like what Lynn was saying earlier, it really just depends on where you are. Um, you know, when you look at more rural areas, resources are very scarce, unfortunately. Um, in, um, you know, cities like Richmond, there's many, many more resources. And so it really just depends on where you are. What I will say an advantage of COVID is, especially in this arena, is all the telehealth. You know, there's so many um, appointments and different mental health trauma-based um, services that are available over the phone. So you don't have to, you know, be able to have transportation to go there or have it be in your county or your city. You can do it across country if you find one that you like. Um, so there's many more opportunities. Um, you know, I would say for wherever you are, start using the internet and Googling. Um, you know, in Virginia, we have community service boards in all of our counties and cities, and they're a great starting point. Um, Virginia recently expanded Medicaid, and so um, the access to mental health services is much, much greater here. Um, Virginia was one of the last states to do that, and so um, I think Medicaid coverage pretty much across the country allows for at least decent mental health services to be sought. Um, so I would say just talk to, you know, whoever is kind of local or do some Google to find because resources are out there, but you have to seek them. Um, they're not going to come to your door and chasing you down. I mean, you have to be an advocate because um, that's just how the system is set up. Well, Sarah, you obviously are in the trenches on this and Aaron Barnhart asks, how many real life houses are in your network and have you ever considered franchising your approach? To bring it into other jurisdictions. Yeah. Um, 
So the first one is easy. We have three houses right now. Um, we have two male houses and one female house. Um, and then we do have an apartment where we have a new mother living in. She transitioned out of our female recovery house into that. Um, and she's actually on staff with us now, which is super exciting. Um, we, you know, supply never meets demand with it. So we, um, you know, probably this year we'll be opening at least one more and then we'll go from there. As far as franchising, you know, we have talked about it. We've tossed it around. Um, clearly nothing has come out of it right now. Um, I am literally, as we are speaking um, within this day and this week, working on um, finalizing our curriculum. So it's something that we could possibly um, use to franchise it by providing some training in our curriculum. So that has been on the list for a long time and is finally kind of getting closer, I will say, not done, but getting closer. Um, so, you know, that may be a part of the future, but if somebody is interested in having that discussion, um, certainly would be um, happy to have that conversation. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds uh, uh, truth personified for sure. I'd like to bring in Thorne Day right now, uh, if we can. Thorne was uh, an expert that we met uh, who runs is the executive director of Network Support Services Incorporated in New York City. And Thorne began his career as a professional correction officer. And nobody knows the challenges better than a guy who worked on one side of the bars and has come to understand that, uh, you know, working from the other side uh, is, is quite different. And he has devoted his life to creating success stories. So Thorne, are you with us? Uh, can you join this conversation now? I absolutely am, Steve. Thank you for having me. Thanks for uh, joining us. You have uh, quite a unique uh, aspect here. Maybe just give us a little, uh, a little background on how you made this change from uh, one side of the bars to, you know, be being an activist uh, in this area. It's an interesting question, and every time I have to answer it, I'm always not so sure exactly how to answer that question. Um, the change kind of just happened, and. I felt I was just drawn to it. So when I started my career as a correction officer, I was still kind of new, still kind of young. And when I was introduced to the network program, it just seemed like a good fit for me to be in uh, the, the house or the dorm uh, as, um, as it's known to be. It wasn't very difficult to be on. And the guys there just had a whole different vibe about them. And it just made my day so much easier to start to build relationships with the men that were in my charge and to start to see them as individuals. It just helped my day go by so much faster. Eventually, I was rolling in the door at 3.30. I'm pulling a cup of coffee off my desk. I got another guy following me around as I'm doing my checks and, he, and he's beatboxing and I'm acting like I got on headphones and I'm giving dabs to dudes as I'm walking by and they're making cereal. And my life as a correctional officer was completely different outside of the norm of any other CEO at any other facility. The director at the time, Ms. Williams, uh, when she came onto the unit and she saw the relationship that I had established with those men and continuing to establish with the new participants, she just, she wanted to steal me away from docs and eventually she did, right? Uh, 2017, she offered me a position as executive, uh, co-executive director so I applied for the position and I got it. And I kind of just hopped out the window, leaving my pension and everything that I had just worked for the last seven years to get myself really invested into. But with my wife's support and my kids' support, taking on this new challenge wasn't so much of a challenge. You know, when your wife is just like, do it, you're just gonna drive yourself crazy. So you might as well go. I went, I went. And I became the co-executive director in 2017 and it wasn't until recently, in January 2017, when Ms. Williams finally passed, uh, she had a very severe illness, which is one of the reasons why she brought me on. And now I get to continue her work and carry it on. So here I am with you today as the Executive Director for Network Support Services. And how does it feel to have moved from, from your position just spiritually to doing the kind of activism that you do? At first, it was absolutely terrifying. Um, I wasn't sure if I had made the right decision. I wasn't sure 
if I was going to be the man who could sustain this type of energy for a long period of time. And then I realized that I was doing exactly the thing that I set out to do when I was a correction officer. And that's to ensure that the people coming out of prison are ready to be back into society, ensuring that the cities are safer and the streets are safer because the people coming back to them are safer. And the way that I do that is the exact same way that I got my cup of coffee at 3.30 every day. It's by treating a man like a man and making sure that he's okay at the end of the day. So I'm loving my job right now. You know, I would tell the other CEOs, you know, while I was there, like, this isn't the place for me. I can't stay here forever. And they're like, oh, well, everybody who gets in says that you'll get used to it. And I said, well, it's seven years past. I ain't used to it yet. I got to get out of here. You know, being in prison is being in prison. It doesn't matter what side you're on, whether you're wearing a blue shirt, yellow shirt, orange jumpsuit, white shirt, you're still incarcerated. And it, it, it starts to affect you, right? I started to draw this negative attitude about my coworkers. I started to draw negative attitudes about the people in society. I started to draw negative attitudes about my own damn family members. And I knew things had to be different. I had to change my perception. I had to start to change my own reality. And being in network and watching the men change their realities by building their new realities, it helped me to become their executive director. They kind of just pulled me in, sucked me in, and here I am and here I stay. Do you so have anything to say to, to Garland, who I think is still on the line here? I've been absolutely moved by the men like Garland and all those men in the program. Um, I personally get to now continue their experiences in my own life, and I get to be their personal advocates, not just because I think it's something that's really cool to talk about, or trendy, but because I know that those men deserve an opportunity to be great. And it was something that I didn't even realize that I had the ability to do. So once I realized that I have the ability to do so, I'm definitely going to encourage every man that I can to do the same thing. So congrats to him, even though he is, you know, spending his time in prison, his mindset is in the right place. And that's what's important, because to make that change, you have to want it. And it sounds like he wants it. So definitely well we're counting on kelly to make sure that that happens as well but, <laughs> but uh we just have a couple of minutes left here and i want to uh share with our audience uh some facts about this campaign which has been going on since uh 2018 when the film premiered we we have now about 30 organizations that are partners with us and and that's how thorne became involved as well and we're going to be working with him going forward uh, we've had 15 uh, theatrical screenings in major cities around the country. We've had over 25 community screenings. Uh, and we uh, continue to keep, keep moving the ball down the court there. So um, on your chat box, if you like, you can take advantage, all of you who are on this virtual uh, event uh, can take advantage of our published 16 bars documents on how to get involved, I mentioned the vocabulary. We have a fact sheet on uh, everything that you need to know, kind of top of mind about our prison reform movement and, and system. And, uh, and also how to host a screening yourself. It's, uh, you've just experienced, I think we all have experienced this for the first time, a, a community screening that's virtual like this in the age of COVID. So, uh, obviously, it's uh, it, it's something we're going to see a lot more of, and it can be personalized in your community. So contact us. Uh, all the information you need is on the screen right now uh, and certainly on the uh, fundforsustainabletomorrows.org website. You can plug right in and make a donation to the campaign or uh, to any of the other areas. Just make a, make a note of whether you want to support Sarah's group or some of the work that Lynn is doing with lasers, or maybe you want to give a million bucks to speech to keep doing some new albums and, and uh, keep him moving forward. Or, or maybe Thorne, because he's got an incredible organization that's dealing with uh, so many of these issues. So we are just so thankful to our team. It's growing, as you can all see. And Thorne, thanks for joining us. You are now uh, inducted formally onto the 16 Bars team. Uh, and uh, I think Garland, do you want to, you want to, uh, if you're still there, do you want to say anything to our audience as we uh, finish up here? 
he had to get off um, for count. He might be calling back in a minute or two, but he's not on right now. Okay, well, I think, uh, I think that pretty much does it for us then. He's been great all the way along. And, and thank you for our audience. Please stay in touch with us. And uh, we uh, wanna wish you all the best during this time to stay well and uh, get some of that, download some of that music because uh, it can get lonely there at home by yourself. So thanks so much again for everyone at CFI. That'll be the end of here of our, our Zoom uh, uh, community screening for 16 bars. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. Take care. Thanks for having me. Bye.